What's going on everyone? Welcome back to my channel. I'm a little late to this, but it's January, which means it's time to talk about my most anticipated movies of 2022. I know I haven't gotten my best of 2021 list out yet, but I had to catch up on a few things first, and since we're quickly approaching one of the movies on this list, I wanted to get this out first. I'll have my best of 2021 list out shortly, so stay tuned for that. But before we begin, let me know in the comments what your most anticipated movies of 2022 are. As always, this is just my list and not a definitive ranking. Also, make sure to hit that thumbs up button if you like these videos as it helps me out immensely by getting my content out there. And if you're new here, I hope you consider hitting that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with reviews of new releases, older films, hidden gems, and so much more on a near daily basis. Now, as I've done with these lists in the last few years, the way this goes will be these are in order of their scheduled release date, so this will not be a ranking video. That also being said, that means in order to qualify for this list, the movie needs to actually already have a release date as of now. That means anything that's just speculated the release this year, especially given the fickle nature of the film industry these days, don't qualify. So movies like Knives Out 2, Killers of the Flower Moon, and a few others from directors I really enjoy like Wes Anderson, Ari Aster, David Fincher, and a few others aren't going to go on here, even though they definitely would get a spot if there was a release date. I know there's a good chance we'll probably see some of these this year, but I'm reserving this for movies that are, as of now, locked in. So who knows, some of these are repeats from last year because they got pushed back and it can happen again. It's already happened to me twice, but who knows. What I can say is though, with things stabilizing somewhat in the movie world, there are a lot of movies to now talk about. So for this list, we're going to go through 20 movies. A lot of interesting things on the way, and what'll be fun is, as always, seeing how much my end of year list differs from this. Some of these I won't have that much to say on as they're really far out and we would need more information, and I'm really just going off of who's involved and not what I've actually seen as far as trailers, but I still wanted to bring these up. So. Let's not waste any more time though, and let's get to the list. Kicking things off is Scream, the fifth entry in the Scream franchise, which sees a new Ghostface emerge in Woodsboro 25 years after the original series of murders. I already spoke about this one in my most anticipated movies of January video, and this is on the way out very, very shortly, so I'm keeping this brief. But I'm a big fan of Scream. It's one of the most inventive series of slasher movies out there as far as I'm concerned, and even though I don't love every single entry, I'd say it's one of the few big horror franchises that really doesn't have a bad entry. It's brought to us by Matt Bettinelli Open and Tyler Gillette, the directors of the horror comedy Ready or Not, which I enjoyed and makes me think they're a great fit for this. And it seems like everyone agrees, as the reviews are out already, and some people are even calling this the best film since the original. So, big words right there, but I'm excited. This hits theaters January 14th. The Worst Person in the World, one of the best movies of 2021, coming in 2022. I think I heard that at least once every other day by December. I know for some of you, this is already out and it's really a 2021 movie, but it's getting released in the US this year, so as far as I'm concerned, it's a 2022 movie. But this has a lot that makes it seem like it'll be right up my alley. It's received nothing but rave reviews, it's from Neon, who's one of my favorite independent film companies after A24, who you'll see later on this list. Considering one of the central conflicts revolves around struggling to find a career path, that's something that hits very hard for me in particular as I've been there, and it's a film that seems to mix a lot of heart and humor, and I always love a good movie that knows how to evoke such a wide range of emotions, which, based on what everyone said, this does. If you saw it already, I'm jealous, but I can't wait to see what the hype's all about when it hits theaters on February 4th. The Batman, probably the movie that's made everyone's list at this point. Now, I'll admit, I'm not quite as hyped for this as everyone else is, as I've come down a bit from dark and gritty superhero movies. Like, if I were to rank this, this probably would not be top 10, maybe it would be like 11 or 12 or so, but this does look cool. For one thing, I am excited to see how Robert Pattinson's going to be as Batman. I'm not one of those people who's doubted the guy and held Twilight over his head for some weird reason, like they also do with Kristen Stewart. Plus, I'm looking forward to this taking on a detective approach in the vein of Seven. Plus, Matt Reeves is an excellent director. I absolutely loved what he did both with Planet of the Apes as well as with Let Me In, which I think is very underrated, and I think he's great at going dark while still having you feel something other than depressed. So, all that being said, on top of the trailers being nothing but impressive, I'm all on board with this, and this hits theaters March 4th. 
Turning Red, the latest film from Pixar, sees 13-year-old Mei Li turn into a giant red panda whenever she gets too excited. And speaking of excited, of course, anytime Pixar has got a new movie in the works, that gets an immediate spot on my most anticipated movies of the year list. Even if not every single film of theirs is a new classic, there's still quality stuff. I've thought everything in the last few years have been at least pretty good. And I think this has the potential to be one of their most fun outings in a bit. Like, most of their films at least have some sprinkles of comedy in there, but the vibe I've gotten from this one in particular is that this is going all in on the laughs, which is always a plus in my book. Though I'm sure it'll still have some of that hard-hitting emotion Pixar's known for thrown in there. Now, I know it's a shame it's not getting released theatrically, it's now the third Pixar movie in a row where that's happened, but... All I'll say is, with box office numbers still not being what they were pre-pandemic just yet, with the exception of superhero movies, this will at least allow the movie to be seen by more people right off the bat, especially since a lot of movies lately have been doing better when they go to streaming or VOD as opposed to theatrically. I know it's not ideal, but what can you do? It is what it is. That's all I'll say regarding that, as I know a lot of people are pissed about this whole thing, but either way, I'm looking forward to the movie, and it hits Disney Plus March 11th. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once is brought to us by the Daniels, the directors behind the absolutely wild Swiss Army Man, and it sees them getting in on that multiverse action now that both Marvel and DC are doing it as well. And this is a totally original concept. I'm not quite sure where it's exactly headed just yet, as the trailers didn't reveal too many specifics beyond it being in the multiverse and it stars Michelle Yeoh and Jamie Lee Curtis, but given who's involved and what we saw, I'm in. This is also being distributed by A24, and while I'm a big A24 fan in general, they are known for cutting up some of their trailers in a way that markets them for mainstream movie audiences, only for them to be disappointed by how against the grain they can be. However, this seems to be the A24 movie that's going to be the exception, as it looks absolutely wild, and it's been putting a lot of the action front and center. And I've seen a lot of people who aren't even big A24 fans saying they're on board with this. So I think this has the potential to be one one of their most accessible films in quite some time. Count me excited for it, and it hits theaters March 25th. The Northman is an epic revenge thriller that explores how far a Viking prince will go to seek justice for his murdered father. Normally, period pieces can be hit and miss for me, but this is being brought to us by Robert Eggers, the director behind The Witch and The Lighthouse, in his first breakaway from the horror genre. And I'm excited to see what he has to bring when he's out of his comfort zone, because this looks absolutely brutal. It looks to be an action-packed thrill ride of a movie that's got quite the cast, including Alexander Skarsgård, Nicole Kidman, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Willem Dafoe, who gave one of his wildest performances in The Lighthouse, and that's saying something since it's Willem Dafoe we're talking about here. I'm very excited, and this hits theaters April 8th. The unbearable weight of massive talent sees Nicolas Cage play... Nicolas Cage. This is one of the few films on this list to carry over from my 2021 list. I'm a big fan of Nicolas Cage, and I've especially loved how he seems to be hitting the mark lately with all these out there gonzo projects like Mandy and Color Out of Space. I even thought Prisoners of the Ghostland was solid. I know a lot of people really weren't into it, but I liked it. And this seems to be something in the vein of some of those movies, as he has to stop a kidnapping plot with Pedro Pascal, all while he riffs on himself at the same time, as he has to channel some of his most iconic characters, which is just one of the most fun concepts of all year to me. Based on the trailer we got for this, I think this has the chance to be one of his most memeable movies in quite some time, and either way, it should have the internet talking. In its theaters, April 22nd. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which is our first MCU movie of the year, and this one's going to be a doozy. For one thing, this has me immediately excited given that Sam Raimi's directing this, and it's his first superhero movie since Spider-Man 3, as well as his first movie period in nearly a decade. And based on the trailer we got, there seems to be some slight hints of a horror direction, which will be great, considering Raimi's also one of the best horror directors out there. On top of that, this looks like it's going to be one of the wildest, most out there MCU movies. Given it's exploring the multiverse and is showing how out of control it can get, that can only mean we'll have so much to explore, also meaning cameos galore. And considering what we've seen made possible with Spider-Man No Way Home, I have some high hopes we'll see some other old familiar faces pop up here. I really think anything's possible, but all will be revealed when it hits theaters May 6th. The Bob's Burgers movie, another movie that got carried over from last year, which I was worried might not see the light of day. Now, I'm a big fan of Bob's Burgers. 12 seasons in, and it's still been at least pretty good, which is impressive. 
Maybe not quite as great as it once was, but I still think it's enjoyable. And given that everyone from the cast and the creative team of the show are all back for this, of course that's more than enough reason for me to be excited. With both a mystery and musical element thrown in there, it looks like it'll be a grander, extended episode of the show, though that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's all the more reason I'm on board. And it hits theaters May 27th. Lightyear sees Pixar once again on here, and this time in another very unique way. This time instead of going with a Toy Story 5 and having fans on edge for months wondering if it's going to live up to the quality of the other movies, this is a spin-off set within the universe about the actual Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger, now voiced by Chris Evans. That's just a really cool idea if you ask me. It's a way of expanding this universe while also doing something a little bit different by giving us this grand feeling space epic. The trailers have been a little vague as far as what the plot of this is exactly, but given that director Angus McLean has also had a major creative input in nearly all of Pixar's biggest hits dating all the way back to A Bug's Life, I have confidence this could potentially be another classic of theirs. And it hits theaters June 17th. Elvis chronicles the life and career of rock and roll legend Elvis Presley. So, I've made it known quite a few times on here that biopics are hit and miss for me. And not that I won't sit through one, but I do find a lot of them to suffer from trying to cram too much in in such a short period of time. However, I gotta admit, I am really curious about this one. The most we got is a very brief few seconds tease as of now, but knowing it's from Baz Luhrmann, who has such a distinct visual style, for better or for worse, I think it'll really give this some much needed energy that you don't typically see in biopics. On top of that, you have Tom Hanks as Elvis' manager, Colonel Tom Parker, who was known in real life for his unethical management of both Elvis' career and personal life, and it'll be a great turn against type for Hollywood's nicest guy. So I'd like to see what's done here. And it's its theaters, June 24th. Thor, Love and Thunder. Marvel again in the next MCU film following Multiverse of Madness. While the plot isn't known just yet and we haven't gotten a trailer as of now, the main reason I'm excited for this is the fact that it's another Thor movie directed by Taika Waititi. Thor Ragnarok is in my top three favorite MCU movies of all time, mainly for the comedic direction they took with the character that allowed Waititi to show off his oddball sense of humor. And this time, unlike Ragnarok, Waititi is also co-writing this, meaning his personal touch is even more all over this. Add to the fact that this will also see the Guardians of the Galaxy in presumably decent sized roles and their interactions with Thor were a major highlight of both Infinity War and Endgame and you have Christian Bale as the villain named Gore the God Butcher which is honestly a pretty cool name for a villain so I can only imagine that means there's going to be a lot of destruction to go along with the laughs. So this one should be interesting and I'd be shocked if this didn't reach high up on my MCU list by the end but time will tell and it hits theaters July 8th. Nope is the latest horror movie from Jordan Peele, and that's all we know. We have a poster, and that's it. We know nothing of the plot just yet, so all I can really say is, while I only liked but didn't love Us, I did really like Get Out, and it's clear Jordan Peele is one of the freshest voices out there both in terms of just the horror genre, as well as just filmmaking in general. So when he's got something out, it's going to be high on my radar. Plus, he's got a great cast, reteaming with Daniel Kaluuya, along with Kiki Palmer and Steven Yeun in major roles as well. However it'll be, I have a feeling, like his other two films, this will have people talking. Hopefully we get a trailer soon, and it hits theaters July 22nd. Don't Worry Darling focuses on an unhappy housewife in the 1950s who discovers a disturbing truth while her loving husband hides a dark secret. Olivia Wilde's back behind the director's chair after Booksmart, which was one of my favorite movies of 2019. And while this is a complete change of pace for her being a psychological thriller, I did enjoy Booksmart so much that it has me excited for whatever Olivia Wilde does next behind the camera. Also add to the fact that you have Florence Pugh in the lead who's been on a roll lately and say no more. Once again, there isn't any footage just yet, so there's only so much to go off of, but it hits theaters. So September 23rd. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1 sees Miles Morales go on a new adventure with Spider-Gwen and a new team of Spider-People as they face a powerful new villain. It's a great time to be a Spider-Man fan. Not only was Into the Spider-Verse just one of the best Spider-Man movies out there, but it's just one of the most innovative movies to hit the big screen in the past decade. And now we're getting more of that universe. On top of the fact that with No Way Home just raking in the box office numbers, interest in the character is at an all-time high, and interest in the concept of the multiverse is also at an all-time high. And while we only got a very brief tease of what's to come, it once again looks to be wild, with the inclusion of Oscar Isaac as Spider-Man 2099 in a major role, along with the fact that this story seems to be so grand in scale that it needs to be told in two parts. Also throw in there the always reliable Phil Lord and Chris Miller returning to co-write the screenplay, and this is sure to be another big hit for Spider-Man. 
This is theaters, October 7th. The Flash sees Barry Allen travel back in time to prevent his mother's murder, which brings unintended consequences. Another multiverse movie. Like I said, interest is just at an all-time high right now, but this one's bound to piss a lot of people off. The DCEU's been in a weird state of flux right now where they have all these movies in the same universe, but they're kind of keeping everything separated at the same time, and they're not building towards some big event or anything. I, I don't know. But with this, there have been a lot of rumors going around that this is going to be used to give the DC CEU a soft reboot, in particular moving away from the stuff Zack Snyder's done, which is made even more apparent by Ben Affleck confirming this will be his final appearance as Batman. And with the Snyder Cut having just been released last year, which fans absolutely loved, this movie has already rubbed them the wrong way. That being said, as someone who honestly didn't love the Snyder Cut, for reasons I've already said in a review, I'm fine with a soft reboot if it finally gives this franchise a sense of direction. If that'll actually happen, remains to be seen. But there are two big reasons for me to be excited for this otherwise. One, Andy Muschietti, the director behind the It movies, is behind this, and those were two movies that I absolutely loved, even the second one. And it sees the return of one of my favorite Batman, Michael Keaton, in what seems to be a way of bringing him in as the DCEU's Batman, while Robert Pattinson remains in his own continuity. And as someone who loves both the 1989 Batman as well as Batman Returns, you better believe I am excited to hear that. Plus, I gotta say, Michael Keaton at 70 years old is showing no signs of slowing down and that's just impressive to say the least. No matter what happens, whether we wind up loving or hating this one, I think we'll have a lot to talk about and it hits theaters on my birthday, November 4th. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is the sequel to Aquaman and that's all we know. That's the big theme for the back half of this list as you can see. But what I can say is, while the DCEU remains in a state of flux, Aquaman was one of the bright spots in this franchise and considering everyone from that movie's coming back with James Wan once again at the helm, I'm in. The first Aquaman was ridiculously campy and over the top, and I loved every minute of it. And I'm hoping Juan and Jason Momoa bring that energy once again to this. Not much else I can say here, but this is currently slated to go up against Avatar 2, and assuming no one budges, though I think someone will, no offense to James Cameron, but I'm seeing Aquaman opening day in theaters, and that would be December 16th. Then we got Illumination's Mario movie, which is going to be the odd man out on this list because... I highly doubt it's actually going to be great, especially because I don't love Illumination stuff, but that's not even my point. The voice cast is really something else, I gotta tell ya. I mean, some stuff I'm all in on, like Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong is pitch perfect casting. Chris Pratt as Mario though still perplexes me, but I mean, I just gotta know what this is like. Good or bad, with the Mario games being such a big part of my childhood, I just have to know what this is going to be. And I feel like that's where a lot of people are at with this, at least till we get a trailer. So like, I'm excited for this, even though my expectations aren't that high. It's mainly just my curiosity getting the better of me. The only thing that gives me some hope is that Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto is on board as a producer. So I'm hoping he didn't let things get too out of control with this, but here's the hoping and it hits theaters December 21st. And finally, Babylon is the newest film from Damien Chazelle, and surprise, no plot summary, no trailer, no pictures, nothing. All we know is that it's a period drama and he's directing it. But I'm excited because Whiplash was one of my favorite movies of the 2010s, and I know some people find it cool to hate on La La Land for all the attention it got, but I thought that was a great movie as well. I thought it was just wonderful. Wasn't as big of a fan of First Man, but that was well made too, and it hasn't stopped me from being excited for whatever Chazelle does next. This is another one with a pretty big cast, with Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie leading the charge, but also including Samara Weaving, Olivia Wilde, Spike Jones, Katherine Waterston, Flea, Gene Smart, and among many others, my favorite Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, who's also serving as an executive producer. So again, not much to go off of, but given who's involved, I'm still excited. And it hits theaters December 25th. So we have quite a year ahead of us. I know things are still a bit shaky in the industry right now, but hopefully we're past the point of any more major delays or massive shifts. I know there were a few last minute tweaks towards the end of 2021, but hopefully things are much more stabilized here on out. And hopefully we're past these days where like 10 movies are stacked on top of one another for like three or four weeks straight. It's great we got a lot in 2021, but I gotta say, sometimes it was way too hard to keep up. Hopefully things will be a little easier here, but either way, there's plenty to talk about 
and I'm excited to cover it with you all. It's really a lot of fun to do all this, and I'm looking forward to all the conversations we're going to have on these throughout the year. And in the meantime, let me know, what movies in 2022 are you most looking forward to? Is it anything I listed here? Was it something I left off? Let me know in the comments below so we can discuss. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. And for more movie reviews and film discussion, please make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated. Thanks for watching, everyone, and keep having fun with film.